Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Santa Cruz Public Library's Community Resilience Project. This is our first session. It's Housing is Healthcare. This meeting is being recorded. Your microphone is muted for the entire presentation. You do not need a microphone, camera, or a screen if you only want to listen to the meeting, as this meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. If you need assistance, please call the library's telephone information line at 831 427 7713. To join this presentation using a telephone only, dial any of the following numbers. I'll read a couple off to you. 1-888-788-0099. 1-833-548-0282. And then slowly enter the webinar ID of 992-9526. 0870. We will be taking questions and comments. The way you go about asking questions is to look for the Q&A icon. The Q&A period begins at about 7 p.m. If you're joining by computer or a larger mobile device, you will see the Q&A icon on the attendee control bar. Tapping on the icon allows you to type your question or comment. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please type their name in ahead of your question. In the lower left corner, you'll see audio settings, you'll see that Q&A icon, and then you'll see leave meeting in red letters. Once the presentation begins, if you're joining by computer to see all of the panelists, you may need to use the Zoom control bar and select gallery view. Depending on the size of your mobile device screen, you may need to scroll over to view whomever is speaking. If you're accessing this meeting via the web browser only, you will not see all of the panelists at one time only the panelists speaking. And then just a quick reminder to head over to santacruzpl.org and take a look at all of our other great programming. The summer reading program for kids, teens, and adults is in full swing. And then we have our Triangle Speakers LGBTQ plus panel Saturday, June 27th from 4 to 5 p.m. And then also People and Stories June 24th from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Again, register at santacruzpl.org. And now we'll be transitioning to our panelists in gallery view. Please stand by. Eric, over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, this is a, a really unique and special program for the library. Um, I'll be moderating tonight. We have a fantastic um, group of panelists um, to discuss a really important uh, topic. And we really see this as part of the library's mission is to build knowledge by trying to understand more um, from different perspectives in our community. And this program tonight is part of a larger program that will be carrying throughout the entire year around the, the idea of resiliency. And, and what do we need to do as a community to continue to build resiliency. Um, tonight, um, we'll be focusing on um, a number of issues, but we're looking right now across the country, but particularly in Santa Cruz as well, how it's struggling with a significant homeless challenge and the current COVID-19 pandemic has also brought extra attention to the issue, especially as it relates to the health of our community. Um, we are here tonight to address how we as a community can work together to reduce the impact homelessness has on individual and community health. In times of crisis, new opportunities become apparent and in some cases paradigm shifts are set in motion. Are we at such a critical turning point wherein we leverage this crisis to build a more resilient community? What creative and innovative strategies might we discover through open discourse? And is it possible for us to alleviate the unhealthy impact that this crisis is having on our community? Um, tonight, we are fortunate to have a panel of service providers who have been instrumental in a strong countywide response to protect the health of people experiencing homelessness during the current health crisis. So now I'm gonna let the panelists tell us a bit about their work as it relates to serving people experiencing homelessness. We'll start with Whitney Barnes. Uh, she's the Adult Protective Services, uh, works for Adult Protective Services with the Santa Cruz County Human Services Department. Whitney, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, I'm happy to be here and what a great introduction, Eric. 
Um, so yeah, I'm a social worker with Adult Protective Services and at Adult Protective Services, or from here on I'll say APS, uh, we work with elderly and dependent vulnerable adults who are affected by abuse, neglect, self-neglect, or financial exploitation. Prior to the Home Safe grant, APS social workers had extremely limited resources and abilities to assist our clients when they were faced with housing instability that resulted from their experiences with abuse or neglect. Uh, luckily, uh, we did apply for and receive uh, funding from the Home Safe grant. Uh, Home Safe is a two year pilot program available from the California Department of Social Services and uh, has a focus on homelessness prevention for APS clients. And it also allows us to assist older or dependent adults who are currently experiencing homelessness or unstable housing situations. Through Home Safe, we incorporate enhanced case management, housing navigation, and financial assistance to meet the needs of our clients. Working primarily with elderly individuals presents pretty unique challenges to housing stability. In addition to experiencing abuse or neglect, our clients often face age-related health or cognitive issues, fixed and, and limited income, uh, poor credit or no credit, and, and you know, poor rental history or just limited rental history. Um, a lot of our folks are experiencing issues with their mobility, medication and medical needs, social isolation, and difficulty navigating the complex systems that our community relies on for accessing services. So our home safe team consists of our adult protective services, social workers, a supervisor, and a contracted part-time housing navigator. We also contract with Community Action Board uh, for our fiduciary support, and we collaborate really closely with another partner program within adult services called Transforming Lives for Care, or TLC, and that's our long-term case management program. HomeSafe has served roughly, give or take, 75 APS HomeSafe clients in our first year of the grant, and our referrals are increasing immensely. Um, I'm busy. And while I'm cautious to note that we haven't had uh, the opportunity to um, look at longitudinal results, uh, currently I am proud to say that our Home Safe program has an over 90% success rate in preventing homelessness when the client is housed at the time of referral to Home Safe. And when they're referred, it's because there's imminent risk to losing their housing. Um, I feel this is a testament to the need for robust homelessness prevention services and the creative ways that we um, get to engage our elderly uh, clients and dependent adults. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work too and Thank welcome. Um, and so next, um, we'd like to welcome Erica Cortez. Um, she's the program coordinator for the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz's uh, Youth Homeless Response Team. Everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, as Eric said, my name is Erika Cortez and I'm the Youth Homeless Response Team Program Coordinator, um, aka YHeart. And YHeart is a collaborative uh, collaboration between the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County and the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Um, and together we provide supportive services to youth uh, between the ages of 15 to 24. Um, and what those and to youth who are either experience, experiencing literal homelessness, are at risk of um, experiencing homelessness or are fleeing a domestic violence situation. Um, and the type of services that we provide is um, case management. We really work with our youth one-on-one -on -one to provide um, individualized plans based on their goals and their needs in order to really assess how we can best support them in being housed. Um, so we provide housing search assistance, uh, mentorship, and connection to other benefits, uh, services, and resources, including education and employment. Um, and it's really based on the youth's needs and um, where they want to be in life. Um, and the Youth Homeless Response Team is actually a program that's part of a larger initiative to end youth homelessness in the Santa Cruz County. Uh, it's called the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project. And uh, the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project is funded by um, HUD, which is a federal, the federal government. 
um, housing and urban development. And so um, based on this funding, a number of agencies, including Encompass, Housing Matters, um, the Coordinated Entry System, which is Santa Cruz County, um, Families in Transition, and other agencies who are working uh, to support people with housing resources are involved. And so together we work to support um, youth specifically in uh, getting housed and um, other supportive services. So um, that's really the, the gist of the work that we do. And just kind of like as a fun fact, um, Santa Cruz County is one of the first 10 communities in the whole nation who got funded for YHTP work, uh, which I think really highlights the importance and the need for these type of services in our community. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for your work. Um, our next panelist is Phil Kramer. He's the Executive Director of Housing Matters. Welcome, Phil. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Um, and great to be here. Um, as uh, Eric said, my name is Phil Kramer. I'm the Executive Director at Housing Matters. Uh, we're, we are the largest nonprofit organization in Santa Cruz County working on the issue of homelessness. Uh, we have um, over 200 people in emergency shelter and transitional housing on our campus here in Santa Cruz. And we support an additional 260 people in the community with case management, housing navigation, supportive services. So on any given day, our team is working with over 400 people uh, on a pathway to housing. Uh, last year, through our multi-agency and team efforts, we helped uh, secure permanent housing for over 300 people, 313 people to be exact, which is great. Uh, we're housing more people year over year. Um, and uh, we use a housing first uh, methodology and philosophy in all of our approach. So we know we uh, evidence has proven that the best first thing that we can do with someone who is unhoused uh, and, uh, and experiencing homelessness and the crisis of homelessness is for, uh, to help that individual family, veteran or youth uh, secure permanent housing as a foundation. So it's great. We're housing you know, hundreds of people every year, but we're not keeping up with the need in the community. Uh, and we're seeing that across the country as well and across California. Uh, same things are happening in, uh, in nearby communities. So again, San Francisco, Oakland, Seattle, Portland, San Jose housing, again, more people year over year than they have in previous years. But due to uh, obviously pervading and persistent economic and social justice factors, um, more people are newly becoming uh, unhoused and homeless uh, every year. Um, so we are doing everything we can to uh, create, facilitate, uh, and motivate for system change in the community and really inspiring our community response. It's great, of course, all of us, all of you all on this panel working together with other agencies as well are making a, an incredible impact. And uh, I look forward to the conversation today to see uh, what more we can do to, to stay engaged and uh, share our information with uh, community members that are also interested. So thanks. Thank you, Phil. Thanks very much for your work too. Um, so, so now I'd like to introduce Jared J. Bar, J. Bear Lawson. Uh, he's uh, with the Veterans Outreach Specialist at Housing Matters. Um, Jared? Hello. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so as you heard, my name is Jared Lawson. Uh, but if you ask around for Jared Lawson, you're probably not going to find him. I usually go by J. Bear. Um, I have been happily employed at Housing Matters for almost six years now. Um, taking up most positions there at the bottom level, at least. But now I'm happy enough to be the intake and outreach specialist for SSVF, that is Supportive Services for Veterans and Their Families. We are one of two grant recipients in the county right now who receives an SSVF grant from the VA. We are able to help with general housing stability assistance, searching for housing, uh, paying for deposits, as well as linking people up with other VA services. Um, uh, shucks, what else more is there to say? Uh, yeah, no, I, that, I, that's, that's about all I can think of off the top of my head. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and, and thank you for your work too. Um, so, um, now I'm going to hand it over to our final panelist, um, Joey Caragini, um, who is the health center manager for the homeless person's health project. He's, which is part of the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. 
Tonight, Joey will offer a brief overview of the services and programs available at the Homeless Persons Health Project. Joey, thank you. Thank you, it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Joey Cradigini. I work for the Homeless Persons Health Project. We're a clinic with the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. And I'm gonna try and share my screen. So I have uh, some slides that I can try and share. All right, so um, let me see if I can get that. All right. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, the Homeless Persons Health Project, we provide health care for the homeless. Uh, we're a patient-centered medical home. We provide primary care, integrated behavioral health care services, uh, substance use disorder services, including medication assisted treatment and acupuncture. Um, we help along, we collaborate with Housing Matters to operate a 12 bed recuperative care center for individuals being discharged from the hospital that have nowhere else to go. We have an on site medication dispensary. We do some benefits advocacy and money management program. We do operate some uh, permanent supportive housing programs that are at scattered sites throughout. Uh, Santa Cruz County. We do some housing navigation and we do case management for everybody in those housing programs. A big thing that we do is outreach uh, and harm reduction services. And Bill mentioned uh, the housing first model. And I like to think of that as kind of like the equivalent of um, the harm reduction model, but for housing services. Uh, we do Narcan distribution. So we train people on how to use uh, Narcan and we also distribute it people that most need it, and that's used to reverse opioid overdose. Uh, we also have a team that works with frequent users of the ER. Um, with our recuperative care center, we basically provide all the medical services, and again, we partner with Housing Matters. Um, and we serve about 70 patients every year. The average length of stay is 50 days. And this is just a good way to keep people healthy so that they have a place to recover. Uh, and it's you know, uh, sort of a step down from a hospital stay. Uh, we have about 100 clients in permanent supportive housing, and we have a pretty good um, retention rate, and about over 85%, and the average length of stay is about five and a half years. So even though we have about 100 clients in our housing programs, we probably case manage close to 200, and we work with the coordinated entry system. So how important is housing to health? Well, this slide sort of gives you an idea. This is just one individual in our housing program. And if you sort of look at the pre and post ER visits and inpatient stays, uh, the graph sort of shows, um, if you look at like kind of, I guess, November of 2018, that's when a case manager started to engage this person. And then they were housed uh, in, I think, April. And you can just see the, the huge reduction in ER visits, inpatient stays, and ambulance runs. And, you know, part of this was just encouraging this individual to use our primary care services. So uh, that's just one example. Um, so obviously with COVID-19, there's uh, people experiencing homelessness or more risk. Uh, part of that is because they tend to be more medically vulnerable. Uh, if you look at places like the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. There's a ton of literature on um, why people experiencing homelessness are more vulnerable to a number of different illnesses. A lot of times they're living in congregate living situations like shelters or encampments, uh, even people who are doubled up and housed. So there might be multifamily situations and those are all sort of ripe scenarios for infectious disease. Uh, a lot of People experiencing homelessness, at least in our community, are unfortunately at an advanced age, which puts them more at risk. Uh, and then there might be limited ability to follow public health guidance. They might just not have the information or the technology to uh, follow up with their providers. And of course, we have stigma and discrimination. So there might be um, systems level issues that might not provide the sort of resources that they need. Um, some of the recommendations that the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council uh, has for working with people experiencing homelessness is to establish isolation and quarantine space, uh, deliver services while in isolation quarantine, 
assisting shelters with screening and preparation, providing services to encampments and other shelters, expand testing protocols, uh, basically coordinating uh, personal protective equipment and other supplies, uh, at whether it's at encampments or at shelters so that um, people can stay safe and to encourage continued access to food programs. Uh, what we've done at the clinic to adapt to COVID-19 is we've uh, tried to implement as many social distancing measures, encourage hand washing and disinfecting, and using PPE. So explaining to people why it's important to have social distancing measures, it's using the opportunity to do that patient education. Uh, we've also um, done a lot of testing for COVID-19, so instead of the typical uh, symptoms that normal, like a lot of places will only test if you have like a cough, fever. Uh, we will test asymptomatic individuals, especially if they're at high risk. And so um, we do that. We don't just simply do that in the clinic. We also do it in the field. So we go to encampments and shelters and we've been testing people there. Uh, a lot of the services that we've been providing are through telehealth. So we're able to continue a lot of the uh, regular non-urgent appointments with the patients that we see by doing telephone or video appointments. And then we support shelter in place for individuals without shelter. Um, and I'll go into how we do that. Uh, and, and of course, providing non-clinical, uh, I mean, non-COVID clinical care. So we set up a 24 seven COVID nurse on call line and distributed that to a lot of the shelters so that um, if somebody was at the shelter or and they had a question about, well, this person might have symptoms, they could call that line and the nurse would help guide them through the next steps on what to do and, uh, and really provide some follow-up resources. Uh, the we do nurse visits at the isolation motels that currently exist. And that's again, part of keeping people to shelter in place. Uh, we do site visits at some of the expanded shelter sites and we help coordinate the prioritization of the referrals for the individuals that are going into the motels and our public health nurses have been helping out with that. Uh, obviously, if you're a person experiencing homelessness, you might have more barriers to care. So you might not have an address. You don't, might not have a phone. Transportation is usually an issue. There's stigma in healthcare. Uh, there could be, you know, mental illness or behavioral health issues, substance use issues. Those are all barriers to care at a lot of places. So what we like to do, um, and this is really helping keeping people sheltering in place that don't have a shelter, is to implement outreach teams. So you expand access to care. You reach the most vulnerable individuals who might not normally go to a clinic for a number of different reasons, and you can literally go tent to tent or under bridge. Uh, and meet people where they're at. And that's providing preventative medicine, building rapport with people so that maybe they'll eventually come into the clinic and, and receive more comprehensive care. And it's pretty low cost to implement these outreach teams. Uh, effective outreach teams, they, uh, they have regular training and evidence-based practices. They utilize harm reduction principles. Um, they have usually liaisons for housing services and they coordinate with other agencies and that's one of the things that we've been successful at. Um, we sort of call it street medicine uh, and expanded outreach work. You know, we are currently working with the homeless outreach uh, service sites. Um, we provided a number of different services, uh, not simply doing medical services, but simple things like providing people socks. That, uh, Somebody with warm socks might not have to go to the ER. You, you wouldn't think it would be that simple, but in some cases it is. Um, and also one of the good things about having uh, robust outreach teams is it really provides a gateway for volunteers and interns who want to sort of, and it allows us to expand our service capacity by teaming up with them uh, and providing a learning experience. What we like to do and we hope to do soon is to launch a mobile street medicine program. So we're waiting to get a 23 foot van that we're gonna basically convert into a clinic space. And the idea is to send a team that includes a medical provider, a nurse, uh, basically a case manager, and they would team up with other outreach workers to provide a, a range of services. And this is a good way, um, it's, a, it's a proven model. There's over 2000 mobile clinics across the country. There's a pretty good return on investment if you consider 
reduction in ER visits. Um, it's sort of preventative medicine at its best. And uh, for people who have uh, transportation issues, or again, people who might not normally come to the clinic, this is a good way to reach out to them. So I've taken up too much of your time. I think that's it for me. That was, that was really helpful, actually, and I thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm noticing that we do have some questions that are coming in, and, and that's really good, and I want to encourage that. We'll have time at the end tonight um, at 7 for a Q&A, and, and I'll, I'll read through those. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to pose a couple questions to the panelists, and this is open to everyone on the panel. Um, the first question kind of goes to this bigger theme that we're discussing right now, and, and if you could, you've already some of you have already kind of um, expressed uh, some of the key points to this, but if we could reflect on it a little bit more, how is physical and mental health impacted by homelessness? Um, I, 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 might, I might jump on that one. Um, the, it's, uh, when people are experiencing homelessness, it makes it a lot more difficult for anybody to actually do much of anything. If you have to worry about what you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, any of your, if you have like a, a bite on your arm or something like that, that I'm not sure if that's infected or not. It very well could be, but I have to make some money tomorrow. I need to be able to get myself some food. Every aspect of just surviving in general becomes a struggle. And when you're always in survival mode, your brain is being pumped with cortisol and that part of your brain just becomes the dominant section, um, making it yeah, much more difficult for people to even do what we all think is just very normal, like brushing our teeth. I, if you don't mind, I'd like to contribute as well. I appreciate what Jay Bear said and, and I'll echo that. I think that uh, and again, I'm gonna come from the perspective of working with older adults. Um, living uh, and experiencing homelessness causes you to live in a pretty much constant state of crisis and chaos. And that affects your physical and your mental well-being to the point where it becomes uncomfortable to accept comfort and services. And, and then there's a whole other level of barriers for us as service providers to, to work through. Um, with the older adults that we see experiencing homelessness, uh, some of the uh, physical health issues that are more prevalent uh, that we see um, include difficulty getting to basic medical care that, that it, when you're aging is, is necessary, uh, not having transportation, uh, being unable to just get your medication refilled and, and maintain um, the, the medication if it needs to be refrigerated. Um, a lot of that's, that's a huge difficulty for our older folks. Um, and then sometimes they're just not eligible for caregiving services that a housed person in their same situation would be eligible for. Um, we see a lot of pressure ulcers, unmanaged diabetes, nutritional deficits. Uh, these are some of the health concerns that are pretty rampant with our older adults. And then when you get into the behavioral aspect, uh, we see coping skills, maladaptive coping skills that are um, often misperceived by the community um, and unfortunate, but uh, we see folks experiencing homelessness uh, trying to cope with that chaos and crisis through whether it's self-medication or unsafe relationships. And that's where the adult protective services uh, framework comes into play. Um, what, what we find challenging in trying to assist our, our older adults who are homeless um, is that often if they are a victim of abuse or neglect, uh, what we find is that, that, that uh, they might really refuse our services, refuse to engage in shelter support because uh, they find that that relationship, that unhealthy relationship is actually what's keeping them alive. Uh, they may be 100% dependent on that other person for uh, you know, shelter or food. Um, and so that desperation of homelessness really results in compounding vulnerabilities uh, for older adults. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think just to piggyback off what Jay Bear and Whitney said, um, uh, some of the more obvious uh, impacts are exposure to the weather, um, whether it be extreme heat or just extreme coldness, especially for those folks living like near the levees and stuff, exposure to animal and animals and other diseases. 
um, and also just more exposure to drugs and other types of violence um, in that surrounding area, uh, which comes with, with a lot of trauma um, and uh, unsafe environment. Um, I think also what this essentially leads to is a lack of trust and uh, a lack of uh, feeling of safety. And um, that can ultimately have somebody feeling like they're not trusting in case managers or other agencies or have they've been failed by other systems before. And so they'll stop them from reaching out again and um, wanting to get involved and getting help and um, being engaged in other services. Um, another thing that we've seen even within our youth in our program that we've worked with is um, their, uh, like Jay Bear said, survival mode is their priority. Um, so like getting a job, um, staying motivated, exercise, eating healthy, all those things become low priority. And so those can essentially in the long term really affect their health and well-being. Um, the other thing we see is uh, low self-esteem and also lack of self-esteem, um, consistent stress, um, again, lack of motivation, and really this affects youth not only physically and then like keeping up with hygiene and um, showers and different things like that, but also like their mental health and their mental status and always being in that crisis mode really um, takes a toll on the brain and on the mind, especially for somebody uh, experiencing this at a young age um, and I think just even being exposed to the adult population um, who is also experiencing homelessness can be very traumatic to some of our youth simply because um, they feel that they feel stuck and they, they um, see that on a daily basis and they lose um, sometimes the motivation to, to get extra support so um, yes, that's my two cents on that question. Yeah, Joey. I think what everyone else said is absolutely um, uh, right on. And I just want to emphasize how uh, a lot of times people experiencing homelessness, uh, I mean, they've been through so much trauma already. Um, accessing care can be, uh, it can be a, a very courageous act for them to do because too often, unfortunately, when they walk into a place that provides services, um, people there might treat them differently and, and uh, stigmatize them or stereotype them. So maybe they're coming in for a wound and automatically a provider just assumes that uh, this person's a drug user or they're asking for a certain type of medication. And so we hear a lot about that and I think it just speaks to sort of the dehumanization of people experiencing homelessness. And so I think one of the things that we all can do um, is to just remember that, you know, these are, these are people and, uh, you know, they all have different backgrounds. They all got to where they're at for different reasons. We can't assume that, um, that there's any one reason for all of them. And, and what I've found is if we can build relationships and, you know, treat people with respect, that's really the first step to doing that engagement. And if you sort of work with the harm reduction principles, so you go in and you don't have any expectation that they're going to even engage in services, you're just showing up where they're at and, you know, explaining who you are, maybe providing them some information. That's a, a good step to start building relationships. And uh, if you're genuine about it and you have a team around you, that's, that's, ready to go out there. I mean, we can make a huge impact with this population as long as the resources are there to, to bring them, to give them what they need. Uh, but you can't assume that everybody is going to want services either. Um, but it's that relationship building, I think, is the, the key first step. Thank you. I, and, and can you help us understand a little bit more how, how people can access the, all the services that, that are available to them? They, they can call Phil Kramer's personal cell phone. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, well, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, that's always a, a good question. I mean, different counties, a lot of times they have, they have 211. 
Um, certainly for the, the county, I mean, we have our county website and you can go check that out. Um, I think uh, also on the, so you have the county health services agency website, but you also have, I think this, the county administrative office, they have the homeless action partnership. I think there's links on there. Um, I'm, I'm just pulling stuff out of the hat guys. So at any time you want to come in, you could always call our clinic for HPHP. We have a, a referral email. It's HPHP referral at Santa Cruz County .us. Um, you know, so, I mean, th there's a number of different ways. I mean, you could call me up directly or email me. Um, yeah. What do other people think? Yeah, I think there, there are many different, uh, I think access and service points. Um, and you heard Joey and, uh, and the team uh, really talk about outreach, you know, going out in the community and really connecting with people wherever they are. And uh, Joey and his team and Jay Bear and probably everyone on the call is, uh, has, has done some form of that. And that's an incredible way to start to build that rapport and build that relationship. Um, so we call that kind of true community engagement and outreach. We also do something here at Housing Matters we call location based outreach, and it sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, but we give people a reason to come onto campus. So that reason to come onto campus might be to pick up their mail. So we have US Postal <clears throat> Mail Service free of charge for anyone that doesn't have an address in the county. They can use our address, 115 Coral Street, uh, and let us know they're using the address and pick up their mail here. So the idea is, while they're here picking up their mail, do we start that conversation with someone? Why are you here? How can we help you? What are you looking for? Um, we are one of the only sites in the North, in North County that uh, has uh, bathrooms and showers open to the public. So you can come here, anybody can come here, anybody, they do not have to be enrolled in a program or see, seeking or receiving services here. And uh, again, that idea of giving people a reason to come onto campus where we can start to engage and start that conversation. And then there's a lot of location-based um, kind of co-location of services. So the clinic is right next door to our, uh, is here on campus with us. So there's a lot of cross referral that's happening. So there might be someone in the clinic seeking medical attention and they start to express an interest in housing or moving off the streets. And that might be as straightforward and as simple as referring someone across, uh, kind of across the sidewalk here on campus for an interview or an intake. Uh, and through that conversation, that very human, natural conversation we have with people. What are you looking for? How can we help you? What services are you seeking? Starting to connect them with, you know, G general benefits. Maybe it's food stamps. Uh, if they're a veteran, connecting them with J-Bear and veteran resources. And really going down the list to try and identify those, uh, those services and support structures that that individual, family, veteran, or youth uh, might, be, uh, might be looking for or might be eligible for. And, uh, and starting to make those connections. Uh, and there's also, I'll just say, there's also a really informal, very active uh, and well, uh, well used, just grapevine uh, amongst uh, people that are, uh, that are unhoused in terms of where service points of, uh, uh, and, and access points are in the community. That's great. I think Whitney and then um, um, Jay Bear. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to point out that uh, the question you pose should be easy to answer, but it's really quite difficult. And I think that's something uh, if we start looking at uh, uh, next steps as a community is continuing to improve our uh, collaboration um, instead of having uh, and, and I think we're pretty good about this. Other communities might have more siloed services. I think we do a great job of communication, but making sure that the persons needing the services are able to understand what services are available and how to access them. Uh, there's always a door, but knowing which door to go to can be difficult, especially when we're relying on websites. Um, you know, when folks are not able to have, you know, consistent access to, to the internet. Um, but I will say just a, a quick answer to, uh, for, for the current purposes, if somebody's experiencing homelessness and would like assistance with a COVID related shelter, if they're having some COVID related issues and experiencing homelessness, there is a county uh, hotline that they can call and ask for assistance, um, whether it's with, with shelter or otherwise. And that number is 831-291-5098. Any of the county programs, um, starting at any of the county doors will get you, if not the right program, a referral to the other programs. So for Adult Protective Services, our hotline uh, main entry number is 
1-800-273-4101. That number will always get you a person, and if not appropriate to APS, making sure we get you to the right county program. So. Thank you. And, and, and Jaybar, I know that you had... Yeah, no, I, I was going to mention that um, location-based services definitely works. Um, I didn't mention this in my introduction, but I have had uh, several years outside on the streets myself, and one of the things that was very encouraging uh, when I came in through Santa Cruz for the first time was the location of HPHP. Um, the little mention of a spider bite that I wasn't sure was infected or not was actually a personal anecdote um, that I was assisted with by the folks at HPHP and that they pointed me across the sidewalk. Um, I started working with some of the folks at what was then the Homeless Services Center um, and didn't need them for a while. Um, started volunteering with them once I was actually a little bit more stable and then ended up getting the job. But I mean, still having um, having access to multiple different things that any individual might need is encouraging should they need anything else, just at least to get the conversation started. And, and I should add, um, and Eric, I'll go to you next. Um, the library, of course, has always traditionally done referrals and um, partnered um, with many different organizations on this. We, like many, though, unfortunately, are struggling to figure out how we can safely open the doors again. We're doing curbside at five locations, but that's a real reduction in the type of services that we had provided before. And I, I know that this has challenged a lot of organizations, but we're very appreciative to the fact that the county has really done a lot more um, on this issue since COVID, um, since the COVID crisis began. But Erica, uh, you, you had a, a comment. I just wanted to reiterate what uh, my colleague said about the um, site-based support and also um, like the street outreach and myself and my team also take part in some street outreach and like Joey said like it's really a conversation of you being there you know simply trying to support and if they're ready for it then that's great and if they're not then we'll see you next week hopefully <laughs> um, and so I think really what those two pieces of um, doing outreach and uh, the site, the site-based um, agencies provides a sense of consistency, or at least it has opportunity to provide that sense of consistency um, to those who might not want support one day, but know where to locate it and uh, eventually have the courage to, to go receive support. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, um, I think our, our roaming assessors, so um, the county has a coordinated entry system, and so uh, the way that this works is that there's people um, called roaming assessors who do smart path assessments, who then enter uh, the unhoused population, uh, who complete the assessment into like a community queue, is what it's called, um, and then which places them in a pool database that can essentially give them the opportunity to um, work with the uh, agency that provides direct housing. So I think our roaming assessors are really a good point um, and a good start in uh, having these conversations and connecting with people um, as they are roaming uh, the community and really letting people know about the resources out there. I think um, a lot of our roaming assessors in our community are very knowledgeable and are connected to uh, all of us in one way, one way or another and are connected to each other. So I think that that's a very powerful resource. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is right now in crisis mode in, in COVID times, um, thanks to the support of the county and other agencies who are willing to get involved, there's some street outreach, consistent street outreach in, uh, initiatives happening in both North and South County. Um, and in these outreaches, um, we're pretty much like set up like tablings and we provide uh, support to the unhoused population with tents, blankets, um, clothes, food, um, and other resources like that that are essential and also some basic screening for COVID. Um, and we really take this opportunity to connect with those folks one-on-one, -on -one, you know, build that rapport like Joey said and um, let them know where our services are. And I think that them seeing that collaboration of agencies showing up every week to do the same work um, really, uh, I think, provides some motivation in getting involved and, and actually um, seeing how genuine the team is and wanting to help um, 
hopefully eventually wants them, helps them reach out to, to get that support. So I just wanted to add that to, but great thing. I think everyone really much made it all happen. No, I appreciate that, Eric. Thank you. Um, the next, next question is a little bit more philosophical and some of you already touched on this, but um, some of us who are new to the issue, if you could just say a little bit more about the housing first model and what that is. And then the, the bigger question is, is it attainable for Santa Cruz County? So, um, yeah, so housing first was a big paradigm shift, maybe going back 20, 25 years ago. Um, the old paradigm was uh, this concept or idea that someone had to be um, ready for housing and present ready for housing. They needed to be clean, stable, employable um, right out of the gate. And that that readiness for housing was a prerequisite to connecting someone with, uh, with, with housing, with an apartment. Um, and a uh, study goes back to New York and I won't get into the details of it, but they really did this kind of test led by Sam Severus, kind of called the father of housing first. Um, and when they first launched this idea, it was so provocative, this idea that we're gonna give somebody without, no questions asked, no prerequisites and requirements to housing. We're just gonna give someone, help someone with a key into an apartment, get them housed first, and then address whatever other issues and circumstances uh, that individual or family or household is experiencing and help that individual stabilize. It was so provocative at the time that case managers refused to implement the housing first approach. They thought that people would absolutely fail and that it was unethical uh, to just give someone an apartment. Um, and over these past 25 years, it is now the prescribed model, evidence-based, tested uh, across, really across the country and, uh, and across, um, uh, across many other countries are, are implementing this approach. And the idea is that um, it's actually held and encapsulated in the name itself, that the best first thing we can do uh, to help somebody who is unhoused uh, and in the crisis of homelessness is in fact to connect them with permanent housing, not temporary housing, not transitional housing, but permanent long-term housing. And using housing as that foundation of stability, then connect them with service providers like y'all, all of us uh, on the phone and on the call today and many other uh, multi-agency partners uh, across the county, connecting that individual with whatever supports they may need. And everyone, we are all kind of our own puzzle piece in terms of uh, finding that solution to, uh, to safe uh, and stable housing. Ultimately, what we're trying to move towards is community integration. So that person that has maybe been experienced as the other and had this personal experience of being treated as marginalized or the other uh, is able to experience um, a greater degree of community integration and ultimately independent living. So requiring further supports, uh, fewer rather supports from us uh, so that we can uh, help that next family, individual, or veteran, or youth that is experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, no, I, I keep thinking back on the graph, Joey, that you showed um, that really kind of exemplifies that, that whole point of how many ER visits um, that person had before they were housed. And I don't want to just break it down to financial costs, um, but the financial costs of those ER visits are, are enormous. And um, as someone who used to work in an ER, I was an EMT, the emotional toll of seeing those folks coming in on not just the individual who's experiencing all that stress, but on all the staff that are trying to support that individual too are, are immense. So um, it really it adds up in so many um, different ways um, when, when uh, you think of that graph, that one graph that you showed, Joey. Um, so, so I don't you. want to grab the, grab the mic again, but just a point just to uh, build on the point that you made there, Eric. Um, there's obviously a really strong uh, humanitarian case for housing people as a caring and compassionate community. It's the right thing for us to do as a community. There's also a really strong business case for housing people. It is really expensive. It's a drain on the public purse to have people moving through the revolving door of expensive emergency relief services like uh, 
ER, even shelter, um, jail time, being incarcerated, that we can actually house somebody uh, for fewer dollars, and again, dozens, maybe hundreds of studies have been done on this. So it's not only the humanitarian, compassionate, and caring thing for us to do as a community, it also makes good, dare I say, business sense uh, for us to, uh, to house people that are uh, in the crisis of homelessness. Thanks. I think, Erica, I started to, you started to say something, and I think I may have jumped in on you when you were about to say something. No? Okay. No worries, uh, thank you. Um, oh, actually, yes, I have, did have something to say. Um, and so just, I just wanna kind of give like a straightforward answer in my personal opinion to the question of, is housing first attainable for our community? And I wanna say yes, because I feel like that's the mentality and that's the energy that we have to have in order to make it, make it happen. Um, but I also wanna be realistic and know that we can do it, but it, it's gonna take a lot of systemic change uh, we're going to need actual affordable housing in our community um, and just additional money to make it all happen and more people doing this work because I think that the, the people that are doing this work are very valuable um, and they do it with a lot of passion. Um, but like you said, Eric, it, it can be very draining and, you know, which is self-care is very important. Um, but I think Sometimes as case managers, uh, we feel overloaded and it, it's a lot to take in and it's a lot of cases and it's a lot of people experiencing uh, similar things. And so I think uh, in addition to the systemic change and creating actual affordable housing, uh, we need more people doing this work. I just I want to add to that. I mean, it's we live in such a difficult housing market that I mean, you really need people out there doing landlord recruit recruitment. You need people out there hustling people. We need advocates, uh, like hopefully many of you listening right now, to talk to their neighbors, to talk to other businesses that are struggling, to be like, you know, we we could do something here to really help the community. And Phil's absolutely right. There is uh, you could talk about a business model. Here, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. You know, Housing First is not just an evidence-based practice, but is, it is the one that the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, basically requires for a lot of their programs. And so when we compete for funding from the federal government, that is one of the things that they look for. So they wouldn't do that if it didn't work. And the way to make it work is to bring that person the services that they need. And it's not requiring that they engage in those services, but again, building those relationships. And more often than not, as long as we can do that effectively, uh, you will see better health outcomes. You will see an individual starting to become more independent and living self-sufficiently. Thank you. Um, so so the, the, the next question kind of moves into this, this new realm that we're in with COVID. And as I was saying earlier, the county has really stepped up a lot of their work um, on this issue. How do we sustain that and how do we build on that? I, I mentioned earlier the uh, need to develop and maintain um, coordination amongst the service providers. And I feel like something that this, this crisis has done for us is, is really given us a platform to do this. I think um, housing providers are coming together in new and creative ways. And uh, that's something that, that we can build on to make sure that our, our services are streamlined and, and, and more accessible to, to the community. Um, and then just the obvious, I think the need for emergency shelter for our most vulnerable people has come out of the shadows. Like nobody can pretend that we don't need this. Um, so we need to find ways to, as a community, support the expanded or creative uh, shelters that, that keep our, our vulnerable folks um, off the streets. And that's a really good segue into my next question, which is what services do we need to, to develop right now that we don't have? That's the wish list question. I'll let somebody else go first. <laughs> I'm putting you all it. on the spot with that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think uh, a lot of us have touched on it. Um, it's a, 
it's we talk about this four-legged stool for stable housing. You need mm -hmm. enough affordable housing, so enough housing stock that is affordable for very low income people, not just low income, but very low income. You need landlords willing to say yes to uh, a tenant um, and a tenant holding us. And you need enough Section 8 or housing choice vouchers to help somebody who may not have the income to be able to pay for housing on their own and may have a disability or be very low income. So you need enough housing stock, you need landlords willing to say yes, you need enough housing choice or Section 8 vouchers to connect that individual and help that person pay for housing with a housing subsidy. And then the last piece uh, is really essential for people to thrive uh, as they're moving out of their crisis of homelessness, and that's the case management and supportive mm -hmm. services. So all four of those pieces, and at any given time, they're all kind of moving and say, oh, we need more vouchers, oh, we need more housing, and really we need, I wish it was as simple to just say we need one of those four, we need all four of those critical elements, more affordable low-income housing, more vouchers to help people pay for that housing, more landlords willing to say yes, and more case management and supportive services to help that household thrive in their new housing placement. Um, and all that's expensive, right? But the community can do a lot here. They can say yes to new housing development, more housing density. So I don't mean to get into a political uh, light, you know, lightning rod issue, but certainly uh, more people saying yes to more housing in their communities, in their neighborhoods. Um, and more support from our local, state, and federal government to help pay for those housing subsidies. Most of those housing subsidies come through HUD, uh, as Erica mentioned, through the Department of Housing and Urban Development through our local housing authority, which provides those Section 8 vouchers. And then Joey and I think Jay Bear also mentioned, maybe everybody mentioned that landlord engagement piece. Mm -hmm. Going out there and you know talking up the landlords. And so many of them are eager to be part of the solution and say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to that household or family who's, who's looking for housing. So um, that's just part of my wish list. I'm going to take your wish list and add to it just a little bit. Um, Santa Cruz County desperately needs alternative living situations for the very low income seniors. We need shared housing programs for seniors and board and care settings that will accept a social security rate. We don't have this. The average rent for a one bedroom apartment in this county is somewhere around $1,800, let's say. And most of the clients that I'm working with are on a fixed income of less than $900 a month. Doesn't matter how well I engage a landlord, that math doesn't work. So this county needs to find a way to create creative shared housing and board and care settings for our very low income seniors. Now what people can do, what our neighbors can do, because I'm assuming the folks watching tonight have neighbors, we're people, we're doing stuff. We need a greater network of caregivers and informal caregivers, friendly visitors, folks who can get out there and reduce social isolation of our seniors, folks who can get out there and do the caregiving that prevents seniors from losing their housing. And we need, um, as Phil said, private landlords willing to work with our housing voucher system and willing to be flexible on um, some of the uh, credentials they're looking for on new tenants. Thank you. Um, I have just a few more questions because we're just about up at, at seven and I'm going to turn it over to the questions um, that we have from the, from the viewers. Uh, but Erica, did you, did you have something that you wanted to add to the wish list? Yes, I am getting microphone happy. Um, so I, I just wanted to add, I think what Phil and Whitney kind of summed it all up, uh, but just um, these are things that already exist, but I think we need more of, and, and I'm just going to go with basic, more basic necessities, such as more accessible showers in our community for those who are unhoused, uh, restrooms, laundry services, um, just more of, you know, and then also trans more transportation support, um, such as bus passes or whatever creative way we can, we can do that for, uh, with, and then also, um, I think, more prevention resources. Um, so eviction prevention or uh, different resources like that. But I want to um, highlight that these resources are needed, but also with little or no qualifications. I know that that sounds iffy, but um, I think sometimes what we've seen is 
there is like, for example, rental assistance money out there, but a lot of people fall through the cracks because they don't meet the qualifications. And then um, they end up becoming homeless for some reason. And so um, then that kind of starts like uh, the ripple effect. Uh, the other thing that I want to say, and this is very like my youth homelessness hat, like youth focus, is more youth focused shelters. I think right now during COVID we have um, we had the Simkin shelter and now we've transitioned to the trailer site. Uh, but I think something even beyond COVID, and uh, this kind of relates to your previous question of how to make these resources more sustainable. And I think really talking to our funders and being upfront about like, like thank you for the support and for providing the money to be able to do this now in this state of crisis. But if you were to remove COVID from the equation, these youth are still staying in the streets. They're still out there and they're still needing the support. Um, and so with that, I wanna also add more, um, I think activities for youth to be engaged in in the community, uh, more uh, sports that are affordable or um, I'm not sure, different types of, of kind of activities like that that youth can actually be engaged with and are interested in. A lot of art, I think we need more art, youth being involved in art, um, just to kind of keep them from the streets and from uh, engaging in games or, or whatever uh, the scenario might be. So that's my two cents. Really. Thank you. Um, and, and I really have just two, two remaining questions and then we'll, we'll move over. So we have quite a few questions. I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them. I know staff have been looking at questions that might be um, duplicating some of the responses that you're having now or, or um, questions that were asked by participants, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. I wanted to see what, how each of you would define success on, on this um, subject. What, what does that look like? Um, to tackle this, some of these large challenges that we have. I'll just take a stab at that uh, real quickly. Um, you know, success, when we talk about ending homelessness, um, it, uh, that can sound um, just too audacious for, for anyone to imagine. And there will be times where someone uh, finds themselves in a crisis uh, and, and without housing. What housing, what success looks like uh, to me when we talk about ending homelessness is as a community, as a, as a community of system and care providers, that we can resolve someone's homelessness in a really short amount of time. So there's this language and the name called functional zero that basically within the course of 30 days, someone newly becomes homeless, we're able to connect that person, individual family, veteran or youth with housing and stabilization resources, all the supportive services of that person can be successfully housed. So for me, it's functional zero. We can house somebody uh, who's in the crisis of homelessness within a short period of time, within 30 days. Would anyone like to add to that? Thanks, thanks, Phil. Yes, Jay Bear. For me, um, it really means that by the time that somebody is done using services, they're done using services. They no longer have to be coming into a shelter environment. Um, they go to the hospital or they have a general um, a, a, a primary care provider instead of going to HPHP anymore. They, uh, we, we create a community member. And then at, I, I don't want to, you know, ding my own bell, but like at the end of my process, I wanted to try to give back to the, the rest of the homeless community. So being able to create folks that are at a level where they can have the choice to do whatever they please and, and, and be self-sufficient um, is, is the end goal, what I'm thinking. Joey, and then Whitney, did you want to add to that? No. Okay, Joey. Uh, sometimes I just think of it on like a case-by-case -case situation, like maybe there's somebody that was referred to us to get into housing and, you know, maybe it feels like, oh my God, how is this going to work, you know, because we do a housing first model and then all of a sudden before we know it, it's a year later and that doesn't go without a lot of case management and working with that individual, but you sort of see them progress and become more confident, more self-sufficient, able to do things on their own. And so that's just, you know, on an individual level, but I think, you know, on a, on a systems level, and I think there's an opportunity for this right now where, you know, in some communities, 
Um, you know, some communities are buying out the hotels and they're thinking about using those for permanent supportive housing or they're looking at commercial space and they're thinking, well, you know, we can work virtually now, so maybe we need to add more affordable housing. I think these are some of the opportunities that might be presented to us right now. And I think if, um, you know, we can have a really collaborative approach to sort of invest in some of these opportunities, we can have a, a more successful system for people experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I'd like to uh, share sort of a, a, yeah, I mean, that did, that brought up for me. Um, picture of success would be uh, for, for working with um, the older adults in, in, in my program, uh, that there's an alternative that my older adults don't end up in skilled nursing facilities for no reason other than that's the only bed we could find. Mm -hmm because that's heartbreaking and that's not appropriate and nobody wants that. So for me, success is that there is a place that is safe and warm and meets the needs of my seniors. Um, that, is, that is an appropriate setting, um, non-medical if it's not needed. So that would be a picture of success for, for our seniors. Thanks, Eric. Um, just real quick, I think the combination of what Jay Bear, Phil, Whitney, and Joey said is success to me. Um, in addition to that, I think for our community to trust the systems and to trust that housing will improve and to have trust in our systems of navigating housing and our services, I think that's success to me. Um, and also like in the, in the cloud that I live in, uh, I think that success in an ideal world to me would be having um, more empty um, units available, housing units available than people on the street. Thank you. I, it's a good segue to my, my last question. I promise uh, you guys have been fantastic uh, through this. Really good conversation. Since this is a, a larger series around resilience um, and community resilience, how can we build community resilience during the current crisis? During the current health crisis, I should, because there's more than one crisis going on right now. I think, um, you know, working, you know, working with other people that do want to help uh, a lot of times they, they don't know if it's safe. There's a lot of fear out there. So, you know, maybe providing some reassurance and providing some guidance on ways that they, they can help. Um, I think that's a, a good start, you know, to, to be open to think creatively and see how we can make things work. Uh, and I've definitely seen that happen with uh, a lot of the motel sites and the expanded shelter sites where a lot of the people working at those sites had not a lot of experience working um, in a shelter or with people experiencing homelessness. And I have to say, uh, they've done a tremendous job working with a, a very difficult population going through a very traumatic and scary time. Um, so I just want to applaud the efforts of all the disaster service workers that are working at those uh, sites and, and all the uh, healthcare workers, of course, and, and everybody here on this panel that are, that are doing the frontline work because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone's experience, what have I, I've experienced, it's just like questioning, like, should we be doing it differently? Should we be doing more social distancing? Should we be wearing more masks? And you know, we have the guidance, but the guidance changes so often that you start getting information fatigue. And so, you know, um, you, know you kind of got to go, I think with your gut and just really be there to have mutual aid and support other people. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we can do right now to get us through this. That's fantastic, Joey, and I just really appreciate you mentioning the uh, the staffing of the uh, disaster service workers who have stepped up. I've had the opportunity to support our disaster service workers at the uh, quarantine isolation shelter sites, and they represent a very broad swath of our community, and they have come together to learn 
uh, to provide and to care for uh, a, a community that was that was in, in most situations new to them and it does represent a, a, a hope and, and a vision for how we can as a team come together. Thank you for bringing that up. Sorry, Jay Bear. Oh no, actually I think Erica had her hand up before mine too, so. I just wanted to list a couple of things. Um, and so I think what can help build community resilience is, um, and I think we're currently doing it. We're, we're letting our unhoused folks know that we see them and that we're doing our best to provide the services that, that we can to, to help alleviate some of what they're going through. And I think also including them in the conversations that we're having and including their input and what uh, opening up to what, tell us what you need. You know, tell us what services you're looking for. How can we help you be successful? Um, I think this conversation is building resiliency. Um, and I think including not only ourselves and, and the community at large and I think also educating the community at large about what homelessness is, what it can look like, whether it be people sleeping on the streets, people sleeping on their cars, uh, overcrowdedness in housing, uh, different, you know, really educating the community of what that means. Um, and also, you know, even just the way that we say things, I think sometimes it's important. Um, for example, like instead of referring to uh, the people as homeless, it's people who are experiencing homeless because they're not defined by the homelessness. It's just something they're going through right now. Um, and then also, um, I think storytelling and sharing experiences can be really um, a way to bounce back from what we've been through in our past or what we're currently going through. Um, and then lastly, I think just having, promoting more self-care and whatever that means to every individual self-care for, especially for those doing this work to have, to allow us to have the energy to, to keep doing it because because it's important. Very good point there. Thank you. Jay Bear? Um, th th this sounds a little weird. Okay. For me, resiliency, the word gives feelings of like a positive way of weathering the storm, but also returning to how it was when you started. And I hope that's not how it is. I hope that this whole crisis has actually made it so that, yeah, we have all these hotels opening up who are being provide shelter towards vulnerable populations, people that might not be the easiest to deal with, but they now know they can. There's so much stuff that has been like, oh, well, yeah, maybe we can do this and stuff, but now the crisis has happened, they've done it, and it turns out they could have done it this whole time. So I, I hope that instead of it being resilient and having everything kind of snap back to normal, I hope this represents actual positive change where people are realizing that we have more uh, strength than we thought we did. We have more services. Um, it's just about accepting folks and being able to, to maintain this course. No, I think it's a really good point. I, I think part of how we've conjured up the, the theme is just how do we come back stronger is kind of, is, is kind of what we're trying to tap into too. And um, um, Supervisor Coonerty, who couldn't be with us tonight, unfortunately, uh, moderated a book discussion a couple of weeks back on a book called Extreme Economies and how different cultures have experienced uh, a crisis and how either they, they struggled from it and kind of fell backwards or they got stronger. And it is interesting to see why that, that happens and try to figure that riddle out. And, and oftentimes it's what you're kind of saying, Jay Bear, is that people gain a different perspective, just like you said, and they see, they ask themselves, why weren't we doing this before? when we could have been doing it all along. Um, and it sometimes, unfortunately, it takes a crisis to, to, to have that experience and gain that perspective. Um, but there has to be something in the culture that allows for that ability to shift almost really your values um, your, with your perspective. Um, and, and there's part of that, and we haven't quite figured out or tapped into all the ingredients inside that equation that allow that to work sometimes and why that doesn't work at other times. Um, but I do believe um, that these conversations are necessary and they're part of that. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna just take a look at some of the questions and thank you for everyone for hanging in there. Um, we won't be able to get to all of them because we are running out of time. Um, but um, let me read um, a, a few of them. Um, are there any restrictions for undocumented immigrants receiving the benefits of your programs? If not, what outreach do you have for this demographic? Who would like to take that? Um, for our program, for the Youth Homeless Response Team. Um, oh, Eric, I'm sorry, you just got muted. There you go, thanks. Um, we serve all youth as long as they fall into the 15 to 24 years of age and are uh, struggling with that housing um, instability. And we focus on serving unaccompanied youth. Um, we do work closely with our immigration services at Community Action Board. So, um, if they have a youth who they know of is struggling with housing and can benefit from our program, they can refer over. Um, I know that we, in the past I did like a Univision uh, interview um, show thing. Um, and so that that was a form of, of youth who were undocumented reaching out to us. Um, and I think Another tactic that our, our housing uh, programs in general at CAB have done is partner with um, people who are connected with field workers. Um, and so doing presenta presentations to them in, in, a, in a space that feels safe um, and through other initiatives at a community action board like the Thriving in Immigrants Collaborative and et cetera, um, I think that's part of our, our area of outreach too. Um, we can we can probably use more uh, strong tools to kind of strengthen that up, but I think that those would be um, the avenues to that. Yeah, Joy. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, I'll just say we we welcome anybody into HPHP, uh, regardless of insurance or documentation. People are always welcome in our clinic, and uh, you know we. We hope that the community understands that and we look forward to expanding our services. Yeah, and same here at Housing Matters in terms of our day services, uh, everyone is welcome. Some of the programs, some of the federal programs, the HUD programs, such as the Section 8 vouchers, there's some limitations uh, with the federal voucher program in terms of immigration status. Adult Protective Services welcomes and serves all. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move to the next question. Um, does anyone have thoughts on how to solve the lack of mental health care in Santa Cruz County? I mean, we've touched on some of this earlier. Um, and um, I just want to remind people that you can you can get referrals to um, through the library, even though I mentioned that we've we're struggling with how to open the doors. We never stopped our services for um, contacting us. Um, so you can contact our reference librarians. We have a teleinfo system. Um, we also support 211. We have staff who, who staff help staff 211. And that's another resource to, to provide referrals um, as well. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other information to add on that or, or, or response to that question? I don't want it to lay, to, to lay hanging and, and unanswered. I don't represent behavioral health, so I can't speak to the services uh, available or accessibility. Um, but I will say that behavioral health services uh, for adults in this county are voluntary services, meaning um, adults uh, have to be interested and, and willing and participate in their case plans and, and seek those services. Um, in terms of accessibility, again, that's, that's something I'm not going to get into. It's not my expertise, but I do want to make that point that for a lot of services that are available in the county, adult protective services, behavioral health services, um, they do require that the individual receiving the service be, be willing and interested. Now, I'll just say, you know, um, within the health services agency, the, the clinics division, we have a pretty robust integrated behavioral health care staff, so, which oftentimes is the sort of the gateway into getting into uh, the behavioral health services. Um, and that's something that we definitely want to expand uh, at 
the Homeless Persons Health Project. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to do is uh, integrate that more into the street medicine programs. For example, today we had a public health nurse take a psychiatric nurse practitioner out into the field and that person saw uh, three patients that he hadn't seen before and was able to work with that, those people. Um, so again, it kind of goes back to meeting people where they're at, building those relationships and engaging them in a way that uh, maybe doesn't require them to come to the clinic, uh, we go to them. So I think that's a, a good model to start with and I really hope we can expand it. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. I, um, I'm just, I'm, we're, we're almost out of time. So I'm just gonna uh, ask a, a couple more questions. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on the panel can speak to this one, um, but it's asked, the individual asks, what is happening with youth um, being housed at Seventh-day Adventist? Um, what will the kids need if they get into the trailers, kitchen stuff, blankets, pillows, books? I don't know. I'm not sure what the individual is referring to. Um, Erica. Yeah, so, um, as part of our, our team and our efforts in the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project, um, luckily together we were able to advocate to have a, a shelter for youth uh, during this shelter in place. Um, and so it started off at the Simpkins Swim Center um, and that was really kind of a typical shelter layout. And now um, those youth who are interested were uh, have been placed at the Seventh Day Adventist site, and so um, we were able to get um, about ten trailers, I believe, from the state. And so, using these trailers now to house some of these youth through, like, kind of like a transitional housing model um, during the shelter in place. Um, and so, our team has been able to go support. Um, and Compass has been leading this effort. And so we've been, I actually was there this morning and I think right now we're getting a lot of support from the county, but um, I think the better person to talk to about this is, is Meg Clark, since she's like the site manager. Uh, she's more in contact with the county and, and everything they provided. I know that um, the trailers are, are actually pretty nice. They're a little bit small, but they're comfy. Um, the county has provided pillows, pillowcases, sheets, um, and Compass provides food and gift cards and different things like that. Um, but if anyone's interested in donating items, I would definitely get connected to my clerk. Okay, two, two more questions. And then I just, just so we don't leave too many people out there disappointed because we didn't get to your question. The library is going to be introducing a blog in the very near future. And then we'll be posting the tape of, of this conversation and um, we'll put that onto the blog. And so that if you didn't get your, your question um, answered today, um, you will allow you a chance to post it on the blog. And then um, we can try to return to the panelists too to see if they have um, a response to some of those questions so that we can keep this conversation going into the future. Erica, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just want to add to that. If, if anyone out there in the community is looking to support um, homeless youth um, and they're wanting to donate other items such as hiking or anything like that, they can also connect with me. Um, we have a small pantry in our Watsonville office and so we would love more support in keeping that pantry um, filled and, and, and stuff like that. So we do work in partnership with Encompass. So I think regardless your resources would be placed in a place of need. Um, but in case you're looking for an alternative place for donations. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is, dear panelists, school districts will define students living in households with two or more families as being homeless. As an educator, I have seen how this affects the health and learning of students living under these conditions. What services are available to address this situation? Erica? Yes, um, and I can't say that I have the complete answer to this one, um, but I will say that as, as a collaboration between the COE, uh, we're pretty informed that the COE um, works with students who are defined as McKinney Vento, which works with uh, overcrowded uh, people who are living in high density. 
And so um, they, I know that they provide other supportive services. Um, as of now, based on our grant, those youth unfortunately do not qualify for Whiteheart services. Um, but I hope that in the future, um, we're able to expand our grant now that we've seen the reality of, of the needs. And so hopefully in the future, we will have more resources to cater to, to youth in those situations. Thanks. Um, and this is, um, I'm afraid it's going to have to be the last question of the evening, but um, an important one. What programs do the panelists offer to help prevent households um, from falling into homelessness? Um, very specifically for veterans, uh, the program SSVF um, that I work for, Supportive Services for Veterans, and, their, and their, I can't talk all of a sudden, for veterans and their families, we do have a homelessness prevention program. Um, the only thing that we require is that they have an, a discharge above dishonorable. But so for, for vets in this county, they're taken care of. Home Safe is designed to be a homelessness prevention program for uh, clients of adult protective services. So seniors or older uh, dependent adults who are victims of abuse, neglect, self neglect, or uh, exploitation, and that causes them to be at risk of losing their housing, that's where we come in. And what types of services? Uh, enhanced case management might involve landlord negotiation or assistance with housing authority paperwork. Um, also, we do quite a bit of uh, home uh, rehab, so modifications to make the home uh, safe so that they don't be evicted um, or, or foreclosed upon. So I've done a lot of services involving uh, plumbing and hoarding cleanouts and um, uh, just basic lease violations addressing. Uh, we do housing navigation for folks who might be housed and at risk of losing housing, and we can help them find their next housing before they're homeless. And that's a huge win, and we've been pretty successful with that. And then, of course, the financial assistance that HomeSafe provides, and that helps us to pay for a lot of those home services that otherwise would be um, unattainable, as well as um, uh, landlord incentives and, and security deposits and assistance with rent for folks um, where that's the issue. Thanks, Erica. Um, and just from the top of my head, I, I want to uh, highlight our rental assistance program at the Community Action Board. Uh, their focus is working with families or the elderly to provide uh, eviction prevention services. Um, and within that, they also have the South County Housing Collaborative, which focuses on working with um, families with um, kids in the PVUSD system. And so they're a collaborative that are really hands-on and, and work very closely together to, to help prevent these situations from how, happening if, and if they already are like experiencing homelessness and to work in a team to help try to house them um, or connect them to shelter. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's, that's what I had. I, I definitely do on a personal note, believe that we need more preventative, preventative services just throughout the county. Um, but those are res the resources available at the moment for CAP. And I just want to echo uh, what Erica said. We desperately need more prevention services um, uh, akin to what uh, kind of the programmatic model that Jaybird described for veterans. We need more of that for uh, household, um, different type of household demographics and complexions across, across the spectrum. So definitely more prevention services and resources. Um, in San Francisco, they launched a program called, uh, that was funded by a big uh, tech company, the Whatever It Takes uh, money, and we need some of that in our community, whatever it takes to help uh, a household stabilize or, uh, or prevent them from becoming homeless, so. It works, it, it works. It, it takes resource, but far less resource than, than um, rehousing from homeless, and it also takes uh, skill and case management and time, um, but it definitely works. This, this has been a, a really a fantastic conversation and, and, I, and I really want to thank all of you for what you've contributed tonight to our discussion. Um, I hope we can have you back. Um, I hope we can kind of follow this um, and dive even deeper um, throughout the year um, as we do more programs on the, the, the large theme of resilience um, in our community and, and, and how we can come back stronger. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, I also want to encourage everyone to check out our website, um, find out all the programs that we're running um, through the library. 
Thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. You have all a safe and a, and a great night. Thank you so much to all of our panelists this evening and to all of you who attended this session. We hope to see you soon on another program. The recording of this session and many other programs are available on our YouTube channel at santacruzpl.org. And then just our website itself, santacruzpl.org, has lots of resources. Thank you again for joining and take care. Good night.